start. So the earlier we went the second hour, it did. It was really impressive. I think uh, people got the except for the snow. They should have been here the week before, but the the weather those four days was like totally different each day. Like you get about four four seasons in three days in Cleveland. Well, yeah. that's like, then they got the true Cleveland, right? I mean, that's what I was telling my friend that that's, that's, we're not tricking you now. You know what it's like right. here. That's exactly it. Yeah. I was downtown Friday night for the Cavs game and it was hard to get to a restaurant because so many of them were booked up, which was great. I mean, that's, yeah. that was a, a great situation. Um, and just a lot, seeing people from all over being out and like, you know, pumping money into the city. It was great. Yeah, the okay. first kid we drafted, he went to that game, Kim. I, I was kind of thinking about him. going. Yeah, he went to the game and got the jersey that day. So that was pretty cool. That's the day I went down. Okay. Okay, we're live on YouTube and I'm All recording. Right. Our first order of business is the planning and external relations committee. Minutes from last month. Anybody have any additions, corrections, changes? Uh, then we'll move on to our first order of business. We'll, Nancy will introduce our landscape architect for the Coventry Peace Park. Nancy, take it away. Hi, everyone. This is Jim McKnight. Jim is a, a long, long um, involved landscape architect who's worked on the Coventry Peace Park in a number of different roles throughout his career, I think, Jim, correctly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we thought he'd be the perfect person to help us re-envision the park because he's done it a few times. Um, and hopefully this one's gonna be the charm. He and his colleague, um, Andrew Sargent, will be helping us if, with your permission after you approve their proposal. Um, each of them is charging us $9,000 and then plus reimbursables, which will be limited at 500. And um, they presented us with a loose calendar today um, that we're going to fill in as we proceed. But the whole enterprise of doing the planning and community engagement will start in June and end sometime in September. So we should have something to look at um, in August or September for the board. And um, hopefully by October, we'll have something we can start doing some fundraising with. Um, Jim, do you want to talk about your bio? He has a long and sure. glorious, glorious. No, path. it's a, it's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be back um, looking at the Coventry site again. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with it, ever, having worked with the uh, school district over the years on uh, several different iterations for not only the, I think, Possibly even the original, the playground that's there now, I may have been involved in some of the early um, layout plans for that, but then that was a, a volunteer um, construction effort by the neighbors out there. And then for years helped the PTO organizations at, at Coventry and several of the other schools in Cleveland Heights. But um, I'm currently now um, full-time on the staff with the city of Cleveland in the mayor's office of capital projects, but I do have permission and engage in some um, special side projects um, that come up. So this is certainly one. And I've got the opportunity to work with uh, Andrew Sargent, who's the Rose Fellow, uh, a young landscape architect in town. And uh, I'm currently working with him on some things in Rockefeller Park. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to work together, especially with the, 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 the needed community engagement uh, opportunities that we see and I think in the schedule that I outlined with Nancy and Julie today that we would have at least three um, community design um, opportunity or responses and uh, idea gathering opportunities. So um, we look forward to that. And then now taking a look at the site with the, with the lens of the library as the key stakeholder and, and leader of, of um, you know, the property. So it's a great opportunity. And I'll certainly um, work closely with the board, but also um, obviously with the library staff on this. Um, I do have an update. This afternoon, I had a phone call with the Cleveland Foundation. Oh, bless you, Gabe. Um, 
with two people, Nelson Beckford and um, Stephen Love, that both overlap in the area of city parks and neighborhood redevelopment. And they gave me some good advice about ways we might wish to continue. And um, they're suggesting that we get Future Heights involved in some ways. And I called um, De Deanna Brummer Fisher and we're working on it. We have to, I sent her some ideas on in writing and we're gonna go back and forth. And I will probably bring back something to the board in the next few weeks, just so we can get all on the same page. I didn't know about this until about four o'clock this afternoon. So it's amazing that I've even already had a chance to talk to Deanna. But um, so I think all of that is all good. It bodes well for us getting some support from the Cleveland Foundation. And certainly we're getting advice from the best in town. And um, they can certainly help us with the engagement part, at least with their network. And, um, but a lot of the, the heavy lifting will still be done by the library. So um, I'll let you know what happens with all of that at, in the next two weeks. Do you have any questions for Jim about the park or the proposal? I don't have any questions, more of a comment. Um, I, I'm really impressed by Mr. Sargent's um, resume and his experience. Um, and based on that, it looks like he, that this intergenerational team that you put together, you guys will be able to um, come up with a fantastic plan for Coventry Peace Park. Um, Rockefeller Park is in the neighborhood that I grew, grew up with, uh, um, grew up in. Um, so I'm also excited to see um, what comes about with that. Okay. And both Jim and Andrew are just so nice. It's very easy, I have to say, sorry, I don't want to embarrass you, but just talking to them about ideas and with an open mind. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna see some really nice design ideas and get a lot of input from children, adults, seniors, people from all different neighborhoods who come and use the park. So should work out really well. Okay. I have, a, I have a question. Go ahead, ahead. ma'am. Yeah. So Jim, Jim, are you familiar with Preston's Hope in Beachwood? Sure, very, very familiar, yes. Okay, so I, I'd like to know, do you plan to um, incorporate some of the ideas in terms of the making sure that it's, uh, with, uh, that is uh, for abled and disabled children. Absolutely, fully accessible and um, inclusive is, is, the, is the, one of the primary goals for the play opportunity, certainly. And also the opportunity to, to look at it as an intergenerational space. So uh, having things for all ages, not, mm -hmm. only the, um, not only the kids to play, but, but teenagers as well as uh, those older folks as well. If Dana, that, is, that is a primary goal is to make it accessible. Great. And what about the uh, challenge that I know it poses? That's actually my school. And uh, I went to that school, most of my brothers and sisters, and I've seen about three playgrounds done up there. My son, my oldest son went there when they redid that one, I believe. Okay. Um, so my next question is, it has the challenge of being upper level and lower level. Exactly, the topography. Uh, you anything you could share with us in terms of I mean, not necessarily ideas, but have you dealt with that or, you know, yeah. I just know it poses a problem because I probably was involved with the PTO when they did yeah. it. Well, it, it has a problem in that, you know, it, it, it makes it challenging to get from the upper level to the lower, but we also see it as a great opportunity to, add, you know, to utilize that topography as a play element. So I think the key thing is obviously to, to design it sensitively so that folks of all abilities can access the activities that are there. So that'll be one of the biggest challenges though, is dealing with the topography. Okay, Th thank you. And you uh, look forward to it. Lastly, uh, I was impressed with Andrew's resume as well and very happy about it as I am too a Temple Owl. So tell him, you know, congratulations and we look forward to what you guys have to present. Absolutely great. Thank you. I would, I would ask that you try to participate in at least one of the engagement sessions because that's where all the ideas are going to come from. 
Um, so if you will have hopefully at least three and um, also ways that people can participate even if they can't come. So um, hopefully you'll find one way or another to add your ideas to whatever is being presented. All right. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Well, thank you for attending with us tonight, Jim. Appreciate your time. Great, my pleasure. I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, the next right. item was uh, added early, early this morning from Nancy regarding a, an asbestos pre-renovation survey and limited lead-based paint screening for the Presbyterian Church. Anything you wanna add on that, Nancy? Um, it, it is important that we find out all of, all of the variables that we're dealing with so that we can plan appropriately. And um, we have used PSI in the past for asbestos reports for all of our buildings. And I think their price is um, appropriate for the size of the building and they're very quick. So we should have a result back within the month. And I know that um, we just got the plans for the um, church last week and we're getting keys tomorrow. So this will help Rick Ortmeyer and us make some more decisions about what's gonna happen next. I'm guessing that there will be asbestos tile. I'm guessing that there will be asbestos in the clock and um, maybe in the wrapping of the HVAC system. Those are the places we found it in other buildings about that age. So um, we'll see where else, if, if other places too. You know, it, there's no point in guessing because they'll, they'll have to do their work. Anything else on that? That's a BNR fund. That's why it's coming to you, even though it's under ten thousand um, dollars. So you will have to vote on that at the uh, regular meeting. Okay, the next item is the operations committee. Uh, we had a lengthy discussion at that meeting, which I tried to diplomatically summarize in the minutes. Does anyone have any uh, questions, comments, corrections with the minutes? Okay, I have several operational items for you. The first item is a fund to fund transfer. When uh, we've been talking about our financial position and looking at all of our projects, uh, right now um, the building and repair fund has 1.9 million in it. We're look, or appropriated. Uh, we're making a recommendation to transfer 4 million into it. And then the next resolution is to appropriate that 4 million to bring the BNR fund up to the 5.9 million. And if you skip ahead a little bit, I have a five-year forecast in there on page 25. I should have put that after the appropriation change to show that uh, we have the 4 million for this year and the 4 million in 2022. And then we're also projecting in 2022 to start funding some more to the um, uh, technology fund in that. Does anybody have any questions about the amended appropriation or the fund to fund transfer? Right now it's just putting cash in there and also appropriating it. So uh, once we decide to move forward with plans, we would just be bringing the contracts to you. I won't need to amend appropriations or move any cash. And I think this will keep us good until mid 2022 based on what we're looking at doing between Coventry and Noble. Any questions? Uh, next item is the tax budget for Ohio state, state law. Any government that has uh, levied taxes has to prepare a tax budget. And most governments submit theirs directly to the County Auditor's Office Budget Commission because we are under the school district's taxing authority. We submit it to the schools, the school board will approve it in June and then submit it to the County Auditor's Office by uh, the end of June. Uh, 
all the items stay the same from last year on the number of levies that we have. We have 10 mills of um, uh, voted millage and we're estimating that that'll bring us 8,700,000. And then on page 24, that is a statement of activity where I'm estimating based on this year's appropriation and budget, what our balance will be as of 12-31-21 which will carry into next year and then what our expenses are. And as you can see, the building fund, we're anticipating it'll end with 3 million, but we're gonna add 4 million to it next year. So we will be spending that money. But the important thing that I included on the five, five year forecast that even with those transfers out of general fund, we passed a cash reserve policy, I think two years ago that said, uh, the board aims to have 10% of the general fund revenue to be a reserve to carry forward. And we should never have an appropriation that would have us have less than 10% carrying forward. So even with all those transfers at the end of 2026, we'll still have over $3 million when our reserve would, uh, by bylaws would be 1.9 million. So we're doing well with our cash. I have to say though, Every month in the last three months, particularly, our interest income is just totally bombing out. When I was getting thousands of dollars, now we're getting hundreds of dollars. The state treasurer's investment pool, we're about um, a little under half of our money is invested that they buy short-term securities and those are tanking our meter investment fund. That, um, they purchase on a ladder portfolio that there's some items that come to them one year, two years, three years, and our maximum is five years. So that's still holding its own, but I would assume by the end of this calendar year, you know, when we went from having several hundred thousand dollars a year in interest income, I don't even think we'll make a hundred thousand this year. So that uh, is going to hurt, but other revenues will be picking up as we're opening. I, uh, our copier money has tripled from what it was two months ago. We're talking about getting passports in and that was a substantial amount of money once we did away with uh, fines and that. So I think as we get further into more normal uh, full hour operations that some of our revenue streams that uh, um, customers pay for will continue to pick up. Quick question, Deb. Is the, um, the investment income, is that primarily like fixed income? Now they're, sure. they're buying government securities like federal home loan, uh, farm credit. Meter sends me a report every month that shows all the investments. We have treasuries that are less than five years, but they're all, you know, has to be triple rated government securities. We did have, I did take uh, classes to get the certification for commercial paper. And I think two years ago, there was a market for that and that paid a little bit above what government securities that, you know, if GE needs to finance something for 30 days while they wait for it to come over from China, uh, that commercial paper we were able to invest in, but that's markets kind of dried up and all that. But if you'd like, I'll send you the meter portfolio, you know, the monthly statement for meter, and uh, it'll tell you all the different investment instruments that they, that are in our portfolio. I'm just curious because I, I have no idea and it's more of a curiosity thing than like this is something we ought to do or anything like that. But are, are we allowed to actually like invest in equities or anything like that? No. Okay. No. Government backed securities. Uh, there are some uh, money market funds, but it, it's very tightly limited as to what it is. And, and the fact that we can't buy anything over five years until maturity, you know, that takes out three quarters of you know, what's out on the market and all of that. Um, they did pass something a couple of years ago that if, the, uh, um, if a municipality, say of Cleveland Heights, you know, they're gonna do a bond to pay for a water line and it'll be a 30 year bond, but in order for short-term financing, maybe they did a two year tax anticipation note, we could uh, buy that, but most people now are going long term just because the interest rates are short and all that, but we're very limited in what we can purchase. Got it, thank you. Any other questions on the appropriation tax budget or transfers? 
the next item for the committee is the door systems. Uh, this is the same company that has the touchless doors at the back of uh, Lee Road, and they will be installing them on all of the bathrooms, basement, first floor, second floor at Lee Road, uh, basement of Obama, first floor and second floor there. Uh, and the cost of that is 29148 but that'll make this entire campus here for public access coming into the buildings and utilizing the restrooms to all be uh, touchless. Nancy, do you have anything to add on that? Um, only that it is part of the, the, diverse, the diversity audit. The um, accessibility audit um, that we are in the middle of to repair these and since we could and have the information we're going to we're going to get ahead of it and do this now um, bathrooms are a big deal when it comes to accessibility so um, we also will probably be making some smaller changes to the stalls and where toilet paper is located and things like that but this is probably the biggest hit um, as far as our budget goes. And um, we also are aware that we're gonna probably change the way we stripe our Lee Road parking lot um, because things have changed over the years since we originally did it. And um, best practice is to make the handicapped spot, even though you have to cross traffic, make it directly across from the door. So we may even have to put like a crosswalk kind of thing um, in in the in the painting, but we didn't know that when it was done, and so it's been we've just been copying the same old striping that we've had since 2006. So um, we're, again, we're going to do that, and when we look at the Coventry Peace Park, we will also look into ways to put a few um, handicapped spots closer to the door of the library for the same reason. Um, which may mean cutting into a little bit of the green space at the very end of Washington, but hopefully not touching any trees or anything like that. So we'll be looking at all of our buildings as we go and making sure that we are have the most up-to-date um, compliance that we can have. But this is expensive, but it, there are 10, 10 doors. So divide that, it's $290 a door or something like that. So you know, or I'm sorry, $2,900 a door, and it is what it is. So um, everything we've put in so far is working very well, and I and I hope that we won't have any issues with durability, but we'll we'll keep an eye on it. I have a question, Nancy, in reference mm -hmm. to parking spaces. Are you sure, which I have no problem with us doing the ones directly across but that uh, it has to be those because I believe we have the ones to the right because you can immediately get on the sidewalk. Well, that was the thinking. And so we're gonna have it looked at. Okay. But there has been a lot of discussion about where the where those spots are. And we may just end up adding one. I'm not, I'm really don't know exactly what we're gonna do, but we're, we're definitely exploring what's needed. Okay. And um, I think we'll get more information from the audit soon but my the, only the bathroom doors in the winter with the snow and you'd be coming across the slushy mm -hmm. you know, I know. it does it's, get quite good. slushy right there as opposed to being able to get right on the sidewalk so okay. i just was, uh, i just wanted you know to and we've check. been we've gotten complaints about people who park next you know in the current spots and getting across the snow the snow is just not good for anyone in a wheelchair mm -hmm. um but we don't have a way to cover the spot so well, and Nancy, I just, I was thinking. UH, I know part of the thing too is when you designate a handicap, you're supposed to have a sign on a post and with having them where they are now, we don't need to worry about, you know, where the snow gets pushed. But if we put it in the middle aisle, when we get plowed, they usually go east to west, not having to worry about it. So if we designate some of those spots as handicap parking and have to have a metal sign on a pole, that's going to impede some of the clearing that we can do in that area too. Yeah. So we really do need to have it looked at. Well, mm. we'll, we'll err on the side of what's most convenient for the person in the wheelchair. Um, but we're, we just have to get good information. Patty, you had something to add? 
Oh, I was just going to speak from a, you know, accessibility for people who need it. Absolutely. That should be kind of the first voice, but from a cultural perspective, I noticed that like if I needed to get directly from my car to the door during busy times, I would struggle because people park right there. They park right in front of those doors waiting or dropping or, you know, so I, I, that might be one extra level of education to the rest of the patrons. Like, if this move, is an yeah. egress, you know, you can't park here waiting for people. Well, we might have to just request too that the police come through more because they do. It is considered a fire lane. You're not allowed to stop there and park or let people out or wait for people. That is a fire lane and should always be clear. And I myself have seen Cleveland Heights very regularly, maybe more so during the school year, make sure to come through there and let people know. It, it is a problem, especially when people were picking up children after school. Many times we have asked the guards to go out there and clear it up. But you can ask the police department. That is part of their, you know, mm -hmm. obligation or whatever. You can ask them and they will come through more often and clear that fire lane. Yeah. Well, Kevin yeah. Nichols, our security manager, even talked to the city and there are signs on Delwood that like what would be the equivalent of the first two parking spots east of our driveway it says library pick up and drop off and we have a sign i think somewhere close to the door that says yeah. pick up and drop off areas on delwood right. not there but people don't those, pay attention as much as we'd like those were added a couple of years ago but they're relatively new so it's it's a problem at today i would love to have that problem because it would mean no more covid <laughs> but we'll 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 certainly um, get the best advice we can find and double check that we're doing the right thing. I just have a question about um, how long are these doors expected to to last, and are they like high maintenance, or do we know um, anything like that? Because I was just looking that there's just like a two year um, warranty on them, mm -hmm. so in the third year. <laughs> Um, we probably would be offered a maintenance agreement as with any other mechanical right. item that we have, but it, I don't know what the amounts would be. We do have probably one a year a visit to some door somewhere. Um, it is because they're electric and they're heavy. So we're, we're trying to mitigate as much as we can, but these are much more durable than our old ones. Um, the one outside is really much more durable. So if we put in what's for a heavy glass door for a lighter wooden door we should be okay and i think sometimes <laughs> unfortunately if you ask for an extended warranty they just increase your costs so yeah it's I think almost we'll like it's, it go and, yeah well the fact yeah, that it's wireless and not mechanical i think that helps with some of the parts too that it's not like a wire could get you know fried between the building and the doorway it's it's got all wireless systems within the door lock and in the pad, so hopefully that would work out better. Right, one less moving part. Any other questions? Do we know, I mean, just looking at the cost for the doors, um, is the cost mostly because they have to, they've got to put everything in? So like if they do break, like the, like replacing the stuff wouldn't be nearly as much, I'm guessing? Like, do we know what would it cost to replace? Like once we have these things installed, like if a uh, well, touchpad goes is, bad. A lot of it is the wiring. And so once the door. There, um, if something mechanical breaks, that's easier to fix. Okay. The, wi the wiring and the electronics, getting them in there is really what costs so much. Yeah. And honestly, some of our doors have been more expensive than that. So because they have the Proxtag reader, reader so. That's another whole component that we don't have with bathroom doors. Well, I'm I mean, excited about them though. Like they, <laughs> I love those doors. Like I, I'm super pumped about all the doors becoming well, like that. And it's just one less thing you have to touch, right? So mm -hmm. it also helps with the. Um, these doors have been here since 2006. If we had replaced them maybe three years ago, it might have been cheaper to do that. But it's taking an old like mechanical push system and trying to retrofit it for this. So I'm sure just retrofitting it to fit the age of our doors, you know, it, it would it would be much cheaper. Okay, personnel committee, uh, really not much to the minutes there. Um, 
Before we go into what the resolution is, I just wanted, I included in the packet, our bylaws that say that is, if there's an addition of salaried staff or a change in responsibilities, it needs to be approved by the board that you very rarely, for those of you that are new, ever see new hires come before the board because if I've already had, uh, you know, someone quits a ASD or YSD associate library position and that position ex exists and we fill it, according to the bylaws, we don't need to um, bring it to you because we're replacing an existing position, but we're looking at making some changes here that will increase along with some of it might even work out to be the same, but uh, the resolution is here. Nancy, do you want to review that or? Um, actually, I can speak to that. Oh, Kim. Oh, Kim. Sure. Oh, Kim. Um, so last year, during 2020, we did eliminate two full-time non-public service jobs where the incumbents received health insurance and other benefits. We also now in 2021 have had two different full-time positions that were both public service, both of those were then split into two part-time jobs each in order to accommodate for better public service coverage. So we have eliminated four benefited positions in the last year, and now we are looking to sort of get two of them back where in these two different departments, security and continuing education, we are combining part-time jobs two in each department to make one full-time job. So I just wanted it to be very clear to all of you, we still will have two fewer full-time benefited positions than we did a year ago. And if, if anyone has questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. But just because I've been involved with all of these positions, I thought I could give you the big picture for all of that. Nancy, did you have anything else to add? Well, yes, the, um, the security officer job is part of a little bit of a, of a um, change in duties. We yeah. are moving the um, booking of the meeting rooms and the um, handling of the meeting rooms into the security department. So they'll know every day who, what, which parties are coming when they're expected, they will check them in, they will check them out, and they will they will also be making the reservation, which is an enhancement of their job, and also putting the work all in one place. So they should know the whole life cycle of the of the meeting room booking. And I think this is a nod to their um, how useful they are when we do the meeting room bookings, and we. The way we, when we promoted Kim Austin to be at work as the finance assistant, she was doing that work. So we needed to shuffle things around. Right. Um, and her old guards, job is still uh, frozen right now. Right. It's good that the guards have a more involved role in the day-to-day -day workings of each of the branches because then they're they're more attached to what they're doing and they they know what's happening. They'll be better customer service representatives. And it won't always be a bad thing when the, the, the guard shows up. And, and they're not guards, they're security staff. Officers. Officers. Um, so we'll hopefully do a little public relations change with their duty as well. Any other questions on that? Uh, the last update, uh, I want to give, while well, Nancy was gone, Lori Murata, our HR director, and I had talks with our insurance broker that Cigna Insurance, our current carrier, had come in and given us a 9% renewal. And talking with our broker, he said that he thought in talking with them further, he could get them down to 7%. Fiscal officer that I am, I said, well, how about we try to get them down to 5%? And he said, if they went that low, would you be willing to sign with them now rather than taking another month to shop around because our policy uh, doesn't expire until July 1st. And he came back the next day and said, they'll agree to the 5% increase, which I think is wonderful because that's about what we had budgeted. 
Um, the only thing is, is we will not be asking you to actually approve renewing it until the 17th. And we would like to start doing open enrollment for people starting next week. And when I was talking with Lori, I said, I'm not comfortable in asking the board to have a special meeting and approve it, but presenting it to them tonight and saying that we think this is uh, a good offer. We're not looking to change premium contributions from the employees. We're not changing their benefit plan at all to increase deductibles, co-pays and all of that. We're keeping everything the same and we'll take the 5% increase based on the fact that we have budgeted for more than that. And if we didn't hear any objections from any board members, then we'll go ahead and do open enrollment um, starting next week, just to make sure we can get, uh, you know, with, in the days of Zoom, as opposed to having in-person meetings where people can, you know, say, well, is this medication covered? And where do I go to find where my doctor is? We are going to be doing that by uh, via Zoom for um, probably two or three meetings with employees just to answer any questions that they've had uh, from changing with Cigna for the last year. So does anyone have any objections with us pressing forward and uh, getting it going before the board actually approves the resolution to renew? No, but let, let me just summarize so that I have it right. Sure. You're saying that we will uh, go ahead and move forward with open enrollment next week. Right. However, not until our second meeting will we approve moving right. forward, renewing with Cigna, and that will be at the lower rate you were, thank you, able to negotiate. Right, correct. That's, that's and what it will take effect on July 1st. And if anything, mm -hmm. anything blows up with it, so to speak, the only difficulty would be is if we do have to go out and shop around, it's going to be a big time crunch to get quotes from other companies in a, you know, a two week shorter period. It could be done, but um, we've only had four employees that had contacted Lori with complaints about what they've had to pay, uh, you know, in network, out of network. And we think some of it is just due to employees not understanding and asking the right questions before they uh, go have procedures and things done. So I, I think it's been good. And, and, and this will be the end of my sixth year here and Cigna is the third provider we've had. So I just assume look at the stability of staying with the same provider for another year. And I can't, in, in the time I've been here, we faced over a 20% increase one year, Nancy. Can you recall how long it's been since we've had an increase that was you know down around 5% or so? Um, I mean, this is good. This is really good. But we, I mean, they just vary so much. It depends on which provider it's been. And we've been with all of them in my time. Um, so just to stay with one is a good thing, just not to have to do a whole new right. enrollment and cards. And it's in the middle of a pandemic and all of that. We have 63, I believe, 63, 64 people yep. who are enrolled in our insurance. And if four people didn't like how it worked out, that's still not a bad track record. Um, and I do understand the differences of their cases. And I, I'm not diminishing the fact that it was it was inconvenient, but a number of them had to do with visits to an urgent care and then going back to the urgent care when it was like to see them as a doctor. And we just have to do some education to say, once you've gone to an urgent care, go back to your doctor. Don't, don't pay these high rates for these procedures. Another issue was had to do with having x-rays and they get the price they get. So it's very difficult. We did, um, we've been talking to them about giving us some recommendations for places to do procedures. And if it's legal, they, we will try to get them so we can suggest to staff where it might be less expensive. And the problem is that they end up paying more out of pocket because it's from urgent care. So but there's still the caps on it for protection. Debbie, you know. the real risk to us is that if by chance it does not work out, we would, as you stated, be under a uh, time restraint to find another one quickly, but right. our employees would not be at risk. We would simply find another one. Oh quickly. yeah, we'd find another carrier, but if, 
if it is uh, someone we've never dealt with before, instead of having a six week window to get right. open enrollment forms and let employees know and do meetings, we might only have like a four or three week period. And if we're closer to being under the gun, I don't know that we'd have as good a negotiating position with another carrier on the premium as we do now, but I, I don't think it's a, um, a difficulty. Okay, you know, I'm four out of 65 people. That's not bad. And, and, and it's not like they had to pay more than their $500 out of pocket. They just didn't like that when they got sick and went to the doctor and the doctor said, you have to go to get an x-ray. For some reason, they thought that the x-ray wasn't subject to the $500 deductible. And they got hit with a several hundred dollar bill for the deductible. But once you meet your deductible, then you're, you know, going back to the 90, 10 or 80, 20 with your co-pays and that. So, you know, when you're sick, not everything is free. You know, most things are free under ACA is when it's preventative care, not really you're sick, sick going there. You're going to get charged if you have to go. And, and we've had some people, though, that have had very good experiences where Cigna, instead of going to your regular doctor, do a telemed visit with like a, a Cigna nurse practitioner and they'll you know, look at you, talk to you and call in a prescription and you don't have to pay anything for that. So I think just apprising our employees of other uh, options that are available that are lower cost to them, we can emphasize in the meetings that we have. Have we ever, um, and this is definitely not something for now, but have we ever looked at what, A, whether or not we're big enough or B, if there are any consortiums out there to do like self-funding yeah. Um, and hire like a third party administrator instead of buying full insurance? We have to do a consortium because with only having 65 lives, we can't just walk into anybody and right. get a decent premium with that few. We have investigated some of the governmental ones. One of the big ones that's out there is Stark County as a health consortium that has a lot of libraries, school districts, uh, a couple of counties even and all that. But the thing with that is, is there's only one plan we have three plans that people can choose, a high deductible, a low deductible, and then the health savings account. And our understanding is, is when you go to the Stark County plan, you have to take the dental and the vision that they have. And we're, we're happy with our Reliant Dental, which used to be nationwide and our VSP. So if we went there, we would be changing everything, dental, uh, vision, and health. And that's, that's kind of tough in the fact that it's uh, only one plan when we've had people, I mean, I think we had five when I first came here and we've narrowed it down to three in that. So it is something that maybe if we started looking into it in January, February next year. And my understanding too, is when you go into the self-funded plans, uh, you'd have to upfront probably a couple hundred thousand dollars for claims uh, right. to begin with, which we could do, but it's still a consideration. I think the one plan and all plans have to be with them would be the thing that we would get more kickback from staff members than anything else. Got it. Max, I think as every year we say, we have no clue what the future will bring as far as health insurance goes. Um, and one good thing about this is because it's a 5% renewal, we aren't charging the staff any more money for their plan. So they also may not notice it, but we're absorbing that. And I think that is good for the staff. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I was, it was so more I do of a, agree a that I co think cost that on the, eventually, yeah. right. I think as things come full circle, you know, I think it's going to become increasingly difficult to maintain these plans anyway. So it, it's- If we want to get Medicare so, for all. Right, right. Well, please- <laughs> I like the Medicare for us. people over 50 option. That one would be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. And we did just learn a lot more about the Sark County plan. And I know that is one that some of the staff are, are, are look, wanting us to look at. So we did take a good couple of days and explore it. Um, and we can keep doing that as we go forward. It's a hard time to change right now. And this is a good deal. This is a great deal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was just more of a curiosity on, yeah. you know, whether or not our size or, you know, what kind of consortiums mm -hmm. there are out there for that kind of thing. And we were in ERC, but then we had to do the, the health 
plan where people had to go to the doctor and get all sorts of forms filled out. They didn't like that. You know, so everything comes with some sort of opportunity cost. And so we're just trying to manage all those things. It's kind of, I, I feel bad for, for Kim and Debbie and uh, Lori because I wasn't here and they just did it and did a great job. So maybe I should just stay out of it. <laughs> Okay, okay. Lori, I, think, I think you hear no objections to um, we'll, we'll press forward with open enrollment and have a resolution at the May 17th meeting for you. Okay, that's all the business we have. Anything else for the good of the order from any board member? Um, okay. I, I do want to I do want to add while we're still on personnel that um, we have filled a whole bunch of positions in May so far, and we have a number that are in the middle of being filled right now. And um, we are opening to our normal hours, our old hours on May 10th, next Monday. And um, I think we have su sufficient staff, even in some places a little extra. Um, we don't, we did not bring back all the pages and that's because CERC is low, but we are, keeping our mind open about when to bring more back. And um, there are still a couple of positions on hold that we will take a look at once we're back in action and see what we need. But um, I do wanna thank the HR department for getting all those positions filled. That was a lot of work. And in the meantime, we've had a few people move on to other jobs. So of course we have like four more openings that we just found out about in the last few weeks. So. It's just a never ending, never ending struggle, but they, they really have done um, something great. We're trying some new things. We have had two positions where we don't have an education requirement. Um, it says, you know, master's degree or similar experience so that we're hoping to attract more diverse candidates. And certainly in the strategic planning uh, manager, I'm sorry, strategic project manager, um, we did get a much wider group of people. Um, I know that firsthand. And we also gave them an assignment to do, trying something else new. And um, that will also help us see more about the candidates. So we're, we're trying to be creative with some of this and, and see where it gets us as far as diversity goes and a wider pool in general. Nancy, I have a, oh, oh, go ahead, Max. No, go ahead, because you're fine. Um, I just had a question. I, when we had talked about the changing the Sunday hours, um, did we do anything with that? Because I don't no. remember. <laughs> um, we left it alone. And now that we are considering a lot of things, many balls in the air with um, the salary study and other, and all of this building, I think. Um, I would, I think I would prefer not to do anything right now and just let things roll and get through the year and see where we are. Um, we, my guess is that we're gonna be, um, have a lot of demands on our budget. And um, while Debbie showed us a five-year plan currently that does not take into account a number of things that may come, up, come about in the next year or so. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna need to really watch the spending so um, I can't see adding hours without taking some away. And I heard very clearly that we don't want to take any away. So I'm, I think we should leave that as a table. table uh, and my table. forecast does assume right now the public library funding from the state of Ohio staying the same. And from everything we're hearing from Columbus, it's going to go down first. We had a temporary increase to get 1.7% of the general fund revenue that expires. And right now it's gonna go back down to 1.66, but then the governor's look recommending or the legislature looking at cutting income tax by 2%. So that will make the entire general fund pot shrink. And then if our portion of the general fund pot shrinks, that'll have a big impact. So I'm expecting probably um, in July, we'll be getting new numbers for what our uh, public library fund money will be starting July 1st and then even into next year, depending upon when an income tax decrease takes effect. So that could have 
you know, a significant uh, impact on us because we get over $2 million from the state. And if that starts slipping, that can make us reevaluate some different strategies too. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see what our- That's a good question, Vikas. Yeah. Um, I have it still on my bulletin board. I have a list of all of my projects for the year and I just mark them off and then add to the list. and. Um, it's, it's still up there, but uh, it's on hold. But we are restoring to pre-COVID hours. So for the first time in uh, over a, oh, about 14 months, we'll be back to 72 and a half hours per week of service at Lee, 53 and a half at the other branches. So that's very exciting. Yeah, we're, we can't wait. And to have Lee Road open every day, again, will be really great. Okay, anything else? Max, were you gonna ask something? Yeah, I was gonna bring up, um, you know, just to kind of hark back to a couple months ago or maybe last month or two months, I don't know, time is all strange now in COVID okay. land and I'm just at home all day, every day. So um, when I was talking about the $15 minimum wage and, and you know, President Biden just signed an executive order um, moving all federal contractors uh, as well to $15 right. an hour, which, um, you know, include service sector workers, um, like the ones that we represent in my union, um, you know, who are working janitorial work and, and things like that. And, um, you know, I know it's the federal government and it <clears throat> sort of operates in a different kind of a very different sort of economy than, than local public entities do. Um, but it's something that I still just really want everybody to keep in mind. Um, you know, I, I think again, $15 is, is absolutely should be a minimum. And I know that we have a salary study coming up. My cat. <laughs> um, I say it's hard to take you seriously when your cat butts in the picture, Max. <laughs> I know. Well, usually Rosa distracts him, but she's uh, she's out this evening. So, um, but yeah. Uh, so I, I I know that salary study is coming up, and I'm really hoping that um, right. you know so we can me, take that into consideration I, as well. I'll give you an update on that. Um, we submitted all of our information and. Um, and suggestions about titles and things to NEO, the Northeast Ohio Regional Library System on April 30th, which was Friday. And um, they think it will take them until July to crunch all those numbers. To today, Lori and I talked about when we're going to get um, our market rating of our jobs for the year. And that will probably also, we'll start that probably next month. Um, and hire um, probably Amy Petrus again, if she's available. And then um, that should come in maybe end of July, beginning of August. So we're imagining that by the end of the year, we will have recommendations for um, salary table changes and maybe some other changes to accommodate raising the salaries. But um, I just, because I know lots of people listen to this, it may also require some real changes in assignments and um, restructuring. So nothing is, nothing comes without a change. And um, in order to make this sustainable, we may change the full-time to part-time ratio of some departments um, because a lot of other libraries are working with fewer librarians and more um, bachelor's degree or other staff and things like that, that we, we carry a lot of uh, sacred cows that have been in place. Our system's been in place like this since I, before I got here. And we haven't really changed that ratio up very much. So in order to cover the number of hours and do everything, we may, we may really need to do some structure changes, but other libraries have done that and they're doing fine. So nothing comes without some other, you know, nothing is, uh, happens in a vacuum, I guess is what I want to say. And I did have a discussion with the adult services staff a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, change is coming. It's always coming. And you, you need to start thinking about where, where we're going to fit in all this because the, the kinds of questions we get are different. The amount of time we spend researching questions is different. What people need 
you know, we have grown our community education department. We have grown our security department. We have not grown our reference department. And um, so we need to figure out where all that is going to lie. And it's just part of the whole, you know, it's, it's a very complicated puzzle. Um, and I agree with you that we, we do need to raise the minimum wage. And other libraries are also working on this. So we're talking about Burlington, we're talking to Shaker, we're talking, and those, those two are the two most like us. And then we're also looking at what's happening at the union libraries. So we're gonna get all that information in and we may, we may need like a half day retreat to, to work through this with everybody just so we're all together on what we're gonna do and get feedback from you because it's gonna take a structural change to make this change. And we're not afraid to do it, but it's gonna be different. Sure. So, okay. Do you think it would be possible? I mean, um, Debbie, just with like the modeling that you've done for the next several years, I mean, would it be possible just to look at, um, you know, just kind of plugging in that, you know, if, if $15 an hour all of a sudden became the new minimum wage federally or in the state of Ohio, like what, what does our budget look like? How long can we carry through without you know, uh, going to, for a levy or something like that? Um, no, it wouldn't be difficult, but we've had, I've had some discussions with Nancy and Lori and uh, besides the pages, we have very few people that are below $15 an hour. And yeah. we've talked about the whole equity issue that if I take someone that's making 1450 and give them a 50 cent hour wage, and then what about the person who's making 1550? you know, a domino effect on everything versus, you know, it's not going to be equitable if we only raise the bottom and don't look at, you know, the people in the middle and all of that. So we've had some pretty heavy duty discussions on it, but I think um, I would just assume wait until we see where we're going with um, the salary get the salary surveys and know, are we offline or do we need to, you know, change maybe more, salaries in different positions and things like that. But um, yeah, we can pull things out of our uh, payroll system pretty easily and plug in uh, different pay rates and all that. But, you know, we've got the salary chart, we've got our matrix with, you know, the, the quad, quad, quadrants that people fall into that it's, it's, it's pretty intricate and all of that. So we're willing to tackle it, but we're waiting to see what some of the market rates show for us in that. Sure. Well, I, cause I was just thinking like, if we could, you know, at, at least if we could see that, then we know, you know, is this something that we can tackle or not? Um, you well, know, we'll, it, it, well, I think we will tackle it one way or another. I don't, I don't think we really don't. I think we, we will. Um, and we can do, we can do a really top of, you know, just what if we just spent 25% more on salaries? which is maybe what it would end up looking like if we just raised the table. Um, but I think it'd be, it'd be more helpful to break that down a little bit. And I'd also prefer if maybe we did it in, um, we're gonna have to do it in, in increments. I don't think we'll do it all in one year, but those that if we do that, then we'll probably get rid of merit pay for at least a part of the time because it doesn't make, sense to do both and we'll use up all the money for merit pay in the incremental raises which will probably benefit the staff more than the merit pay will so th that's why it's complicated but i I'd, I'd be happy to to walk through it with you max i mean it, it it's possible but we are going to get to a point where we are very slim on that carryover and it's going to intersect with that probably that 2004 levy so by the time we get there, we will probably really need it if we do what we think we're going to do. So sure. um, I, I think it's a short, I think we'll, you'll see a change soon. And I think we'll talk about it with everyone when, when we can do it with some, make some sense of it. But I, but I'm happy to walk through the, just the budget, high level budget thing with you. Sure. Okay. All right. Okie doke. But we, are, right. we have talked about it, just so you know. It's going on back in the background. So did someone need to say something? 
Okay. 